Ja. I like your socks. Rabbi. Rabbi. Paging Rabbi Durbin. Paging Rabbi Durbin. from Pembroke Pines. Come on in. Amen. We now have a full compliment. Rabbi. Almost. Rabbi. When Rabbi is making a point, it's very difficult to interrupt him. Come on. <laughs> Rabbi, you look great in that suit. You look very sharp. The diet is working. You, you look good. Shake. Yes. We are. Can, we are starting. No, we're going to jump. I think we're going to roll. You guys get something to eat if you're starving, and I'll just introduce you. So I want to welcome you personally to our Interfaith Lunch and Learn, in which we break bread together and we learn about each other's faiths. I'd like to introduce the God Squad to you. You know, Sheikh Shafayat from down in Pembroke Pines, the Al Hikmat Wisdom Center. Sheikh, go to the front of the line, Sheikh. Sheikh hasn't eaten since breakfast. Go to the front of the line, brother. There we may thank have you him so much. fainting on the way. Rabbi Matthew Durbin from Temple Beit Hayam here in Stewart. <laughs> Father Christian Anderson from right here in St. Mary's. And I'm Darcy Weir. Darcy Weir. Darcy Weir. Normally, we would have Pastor Gore here from the Pentecostal Church of God in Christ in Stewart, but he's had a few health issues, and we wanted him to get a little bit stronger before he got him back in the ring again. So be praying for him so he'll get back to his former self. A word about our format this week and next week. We're trying to use all of our time for the panel discussion. We'll see how that goes. We are hoping to save question and answer till the very last session on May 1st, but we'll see how it goes. If we don't have a chance to uh, get to your questions, hand them to me on a piece of paper between now and the final session, or email them to me, and it's a very simple email. It's my name, Darcy Weir, D-A-R-C-Y-W-E-I-R, -E at mac.com, and I'll save them up for the final session. The topic that our panel of experts chose for this Interfaith Lunch and Learn is myth-busting. Now, what do we mean by a myth? In this context, it's a preconceived idea that's accepted as truth without taking an objective, closer look. Usually, there is a grain of truth, at least, in the myth, and that's what gives it its sticking power. But when you subject it to a little closer scrutiny, you discover that the truth may be a little more nuanced and perhaps completely different from the myth that you had accepted as fact. You may have been mistaken. Oh. <laughs> 
So this week we're going to look at the position of women in the Abrahamic faiths. Many people say that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are fundamentally patriarchal religions. That is, religions in which men rule. And some would go so far as to say that the Abrahamic faiths are downright misogynistic. Ooh. Now, is that a myth, or is there truth to it? Next week, we'll be considering the myth or the truism that these faiths historically have given rise to more conflict, violence, and war than any other single factor. So buckle up, fasten your seat belts, there might be some turbulence ahead. We'll begin by considering the subject of patriarchy from a scriptural point of view. What did the Holy Scriptures teach about the position and role of women in the Hebrew, Christian, and Islamic faiths? I was going to lead off with the sheikh, but as long as he is eating, I'll turn to the rabbi. Yeah. Rabbi Matthew, in the Bible, although men and women seem to be created equal in the first chapters of Genesis, both are made in the image of God. When we come to chapter three and the fall, as God curses the serpent and Adam and Eve, he explicitly says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So Rabbi, what do you understand this scripture to mean? In what way does a man rule over a woman? <laughs> The rabbinic sigh. <laughs> so let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, okay? Because I think most people are familiar with Genesis chapter 2, although we also will give credit to Christianity who created chapters and verses. Okay. Um, that was never done within a Jewish context because we don't have pages. They're Scrolls. Scrolls that are sewn together. But if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, it says that God created man and woman together. Created man and woman equal. How quickly we forget and yet go back to the story of Genesis chapter 2 and then, of course, Darcy, as you mentioned, chapter 3 of the fall of man. I think it's twofold. One is we have to understand both for us as Jews, who wrote the Torah, mm. right? In, in some way, as a Reformed Jew or progressive Jew, I see the Torah as divinely inspired by God, but written by man. Okay, so that interpretive process will come forward in terms of if the Bible was created by men, therefore, women's voices are less than. There is a Midrashic story. And for those that are not familiar, Midrash is the stories or the parables that the rabbis created 1,800 some odd years ago to fill in some of the biblical gaps. And one of them happens to be from Genesis chapter 1. Because the rabbis ask, what happened? Right? If I were to go around the room and say, who came first, man or woman? Most of us, and again, not casting any judgment, most of us would say, well, man came first, God caused man a deep sleep, took his side. And did a better job the second time. Sure. <laughs> okay. But that story, the rabbis unpack and say, well, if we look at it and we have a name, Adam, which comes from the Hebrew Adama, the earth. You have Eve, Chava, the mother of all life. The rabbis go back and say, then who are this? And God created man and woman together. Who are these unnamed people? The Midrashic story says, I think we talked about this um, earlier in previous sessions, is that woman is known in our tradition as Lilith. Now, Lilith, only one reference 
one reference to Lilith found in the book of Isaiah. She is known as queen of the demon ladies. And Darcy, to go back on your point in terms of subservience or inferiority, it comes back to that moment. Because the Midrash says that God spoke to man and woman and said, you shall order the world together. So man comes out, and man takes it upon himself to order the world. Woman doesn't. And why is that? Because man thought he knew best. That sounds kind of patriarchal, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Okay. And in the same context, as Jews, we do not believe in hell. We do believe in the underworld, kind of that limbo stage known as Sheol. Woman goes down to Sheol, and God appears and says, very famous adage that I'm sure we've heard before, it is not fitting for man to be alone. To be alone. Go back to your man. And woman responds, and I'll have a little biblical license here, no way. <laughs> but actually, the argument that she uses is, but God, you told us both to order the world. I, woman, am less than, and man is doing all of it. So God says, go back. She says, no. And God says, if you do not go back, you are destined to stay in the underworld forever. And in not so many words, she says, better me stay here hmm. than go back to that earthly realm. So God keeps her in the land of Sheol. That also manifests itself in Jewish superstition. Right? We don't say to a pregnant woman, mazel tov, mazel tov, because life is tenuous. We would say, b'sha'a tova, in the time to come, may this be a joyous celebration for you. Okay? The breaking of the glass on a Jewish wedding is to frighten Lilith from snatching up our husbands. In the beginning of a Jewish wedding, the groom walks around her bride seven times to build up an invisible wall to protect that in and of itself has always been that kind of challenge between the Midrash and why is in our world today, if we call equality equality for equal for what it's worth, how is it that we have this huge misnomer that women seemingly seem to be less than when in some way their responsibilities and their obligations are much higher? Let's, let's pause there for a moment. Their obligations are much higher in terms of the domestic realm. The, so you would kind of come down on the side of complementarity, that they're both created equal, but they have different domains in which they each have authority. So that is why it wasn't until the 70s that women could become rabbis. And I have to say right away that rabbi's wife is a rabbi. But it took a long time to get there. I do have to ask you one question that I've asked you before, but for everybody's benefit here, I'm going to put you on the spot. I've heard that Jewish men daily thank God that they were not born Gentiles, women, or slaves. Is that true? And what does that say about the way women are perceived? <clears throat> so there is, there is, and the, the prayer that we have is actually what we call Birch HaShachar, is our morning blessings. And within our morning blessings, there is a statement that says, thank you, God, for not making me a woman. Thank you, God, for not making me a Gentile. And thank you, God, for not making me a slave. We look at those terminologies and that phrase in a negative way today, right? I'm sure if we were to pull the room, it sounds... Misogynistic. Yes. <laughs> Not the case. And actually, the reason why that statement is there is because men are required. We have always been required for certain ritual and for certain... Um, things that we do. Mm -hmm. So when it says, thank you, God, for not making me a woman, says, thank you, God, for allowing me the opportunity to be a man so that I can, um, that I can fulfill your commandments. 
A woman, if she so chooses, can take on the commandments. Okay? There's a difference. A woman may choose. A man has no choice. So when it says, thank you, God, for not making me a Gentile, what it says is really in the positive, thank you, God, for allowing me the opportunity to be Jewish and to take on the mitzvot, those commandments. The 600 and... Mm -hmm. 13. 13 commandments. Well, I'm she... just glad we're not asking me to rifle off... 613. No, I, I won't do that, and, and the ones that women don't have to fulfill. Turning to the shake, now that I have you here, it struck me as I prepared for this discussion that of the three faiths, it is only in the Quran that it's explicitly stated that men and women are created equal. And I discovered as I was kind of preparing for this that women were given many more rights earlier than their Jewish and Christian counterparts. For example, the Quran instructs Muslims to educate their daughters as well as their sons. It grants women the right to own and inherit property and even to divorce a husband under certain conditions. And these were rights and privileges that were not given to Christians and Jews, Jewish women, Christian women, until much later. However, it seems to me that in the centuries after the Quran was first revealed to Muhammad, that those rights were not universally observed. Muslim women have lost ground in terms of equality in some parts of the world, but in the Quran at least, men and women are said to be absolutely equal. Can you tell us more about what the Quran has to say about the role of women compared to men? So, um, well, once more, thanks very much for being here. It's really a pleasure and the wonderful it's great to have you back. that I had. <laughs> so basically, I mean, you technically answered the question there, but I'm just going to explain it a little more by saying that the Quran says something else and what we see people do is something else. So clearly, um, yes, the Quran clearly says that women and men have equal rights, but it's the culture of people. You've got to remember, Islam has a lot of converts, a lot of reverts. So if you look into places like Bangladesh and Pakistan and India, and then America and South America and Africa, Russia, China, all these countries got their own cultures. So when these people came to Islam, a lot of them kept their culture. Mm -hmm. so, and I have always had a hard time with that. You know, throughout the month of Ramadan, fasting, I kept on telling people, you have read the Quran, you have listened to the Quran, you need to live by the Quran. Mm -hmm. And that's where the problem is. I, you, you clearly made it, and I don't want to repeat it. Women have all these rights. You know, if a man gets married to a woman, and the woman... The man does not want to have children, and the woman wants children. She has the rights 100% to be divorced. He cannot dictate that to her. He also, she has the rights to decide if she wants to have children or not, because she's the one who is making the children. I may probably jump to another topic here, but that's how much rights you have, the rights of divorce. And it's, but it's culture. In the different countries throughout the world, unfortunately, that has misrepresented Islam, and everyone thinks, well, it's, most, it's Islam, it's Islam. You go into the Arab world, we always had that problem, where, you know, I just came back from, uh, from the pilgrimage a couple of weeks ago, and once upon a time, when I went to Saudi Arabia um, 20 years ago, you could not see a woman on immigration, if the, some of you travel to Jeddah or wherever, you could not see a woman on the immigration at the airport, in a position now the women are immigration officers the women are checking you out at the airline counters it's called the 2030 vision so to answer the question again it was all the people's doing nothing to do with the quran or the prophet saying peace be upon him. 
in terms of the garb, you know, the niqab or the burqa, is that mandated in the Quran or is that cultural? So even that, it's very debatable amongst the scholars in the Quran. Some people say it was specifically only for the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, because they were, they were considered like the mothers of the believers, you know, like Mary, mm. Mother Mary, as we would say. So different respect and dignity and integrity goes for her. So they did not want other women, to, other men to look at them and have any sort of idea of lust on their beauty and their face and their hair, etc. So it was, so some say it's for all women, but it generally the, 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 the general consensus is it's the woman's choice based on her faith. The, the garb that the woman would dress in Islam, you know, it's a, a Mother Mary sort of thing. You guys see how Mother Mary dresses, how a nun dresses, typically like a Muslim woman. The, 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 the modesty. The, yeah, the, the, the nun in Christianity. To be modest. and To be modest. And so it's a very Abrahamic thing. It's an Abrahamic thing that continued on in Islam. So it's not like this garb that women wear in Islam is to oppress them and it's something that came about from the Quran. No, it was there ever since Moses and Jesus and, 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 and those prophets before. And the it's messages. a more tradition. Excellent, yeah. It's an Abrahamic dress code. This may sound like an impertinent question, and I don't mean it to be, but I've always wondered when a woman is wearing the full burqa with just the eye slit, what happens in the airport, you know, when they want to identify you and, and you, you know, you have to see a face or something? What happens? So, if they are in a Muslim country, sometimes they take the risk of just allowing them to go through, mm. but generally, Muslim countries or no Muslim countries, they're supposed to lift the, 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 the veil and let the inspector or the, the person in authority uh, look at the identification card or their passport and look at their face. So in cases of need and necessity, the permissibility is there. Thank you. Uh, one more question, um, because I've read that there is some feminist reinterpretation of some of the prophet's sayings and the teachings in the Quran. Uh, and that in fact, some women, these more on the more feminist end, have become imams. Very rare, but this has happened. So I just wonder if your hypothetical question, if your daughter came to you and said, Father, my dream in life is to become an imam. What would you say to her? Well, you know, generally <laughs> in the Muslim world, women are, do not become imams. Yes, you would have had one or two exceptions, and I need to say this because, you know, I know this is recorded. This will be broadcasted back. <laughs> I, I got to be very careful. And I sometimes use back this program, and I want to, and let your, 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 your technical need team know we'll play it back on Alikma TV. So I have to be very <laughs> correct. So what I say here will not only go for you listening, but worldwide. So there have been one or two women who have taken the position as imams, but that is to do with a different school of thought and different practices. Very, very, very exceptional. So I don't need to get into that detail. Okay. Generally in Islam, it's not that a daughter or a wife will feel offended if you tell them no, because the reason in Islam for a woman not being an imam, it's not because of an inferior complex. Oh, no, no, no. It's because of the rights of the woman according to the Islamic law, meaning that women have more authority and rights in other areas as a wife. As so a this mother. is rather like what the rabbi yes, like was what saying. what the rabbi was saying. Like, as a wife, as a mother, as a daughter. You know, they have so much more rights in their family life and their domestic life in caring with their children and, um, you know, pregnancy, nursing, 
They don't want to uh, um, deprive them of those rights. So in Islam, it's considered... And, and those sometimes don't appear as rights to us. No, it, generally the they public, can be, it doesn't. They can be somewhat burdensome. Does that burden ever get shared with the man? I mean, the caring oh, yeah, for children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a famous joke about this. I don't know if we have time to share jokes, but anyhow. Um, <laughs> I will have to share that joke now that Please. you mentioned that. So... Um, it's, it's because, from an Islamic point of view, it's a concession, an exception that the women are given that as a Muslim leader, you know, it's like, you gotta consider it as a responsibility when you become an Imam. So, the man gotta lead the prayer five times a day. You gotta do all these nine yards duties, going to mosque all day, going to pilgrimage, leading groups. Lead. So, Islam wanted to save the woman from that call and that responsibility and that extra burden. So, we know it's a concession, it's an exemption. It is not about an inferior complex that they're not allowed to do this. Oh, no, no, no. Technically, they're the boss of the imams. They're the ones who tell their husbands what to say on the pulpit. I'm just kidding. They're the ones who dictate the pace. I don't know if the rabbi and the priest's wife does that. But they have so much authority. You know, in Islam, when the man, the imam leads the prayer, the law is, if you have women and children in the audience, you need to lead it, you need to cut it short. You need to cut your speech Because short. our attention span is so short? No, 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 not that, that attention span. Because you don't want to cause inconvenience to the children. You don't want to cause inconvenience to the mothers. So you cut your, you cut your prayer. And if you can cut the prayer, the mm. spiritual prayer, then you can imagine you've got to concise your speech also. So they take a lot of rights, even though they're not the imams. But so in a, a sense, it's similar to what the rabbi was saying that the male has to, and I'm comparing him to an imam in that sense, has to keep all of these 613 commandments. An imam has all of these duties that a woman could not have time for if she is occupying her complementary role in the home. Yes, that? because of that. So it's a concession because if she became the imam, then she has to exercise that authority. Right. So that's where the exemption comes. And do I have the minute to share the joke? To share the joke, it's please. Real... I was gonna say, Listen did you to tell it. the joke and I missed I hope it? No one feels bad. I were, I were a young guy and I never understood this joke. One of my uncle, Rabbi and Father, this is interesting. They said, exactly <laughs> what you said here about, um, is it a burden for women or do men share the burden? So my uncle, who passed away now, 40 years ago, he told me this, 50 years ago. He said to the women got together and they demonstrated to God and they said to God, why do men have to have children? Why is it women alone got to have the pain and the burden of carrying a baby for nine months? And they negotiated with God and he said, I know best, I know best, I know why women must have the baby and not men become pregnant, women be... Anyhow, end of the day, God gave in to them and said, okay, I will now have, um, I will now have, the woman still have the baby, but let the man have the pain. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because God said, you guys not that smart. I'm not going to give you 100%. Women will get the blessings of being the mothers. No pain. No delivery pain. No pregnancy pain. Let the men carry the pain. So this woman, this husband and wife, they got the deal. The woman got pregnant, and hear what? The neighbor's husband was getting the pain. <laughs> oh, no, that's just a joke. Oh. So, <laughs> listen, I mean, we all had us. The joke about here is that God said, I know the wisdom. You keep that cool. God keeps all the secrets. The wrong man will get the pain. Anyhow, that was a joke. That was just a Understood. joke. Understood. I was a little boy, and I always have to share a joke with people. You, you, because you, we spoke about burden, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I know exactly so what you're saying. So be careful who carries the burden. Anyhow. It reminds me of something that Mark Twain once said when he was asked, what would the people of the earth be without woman? And his answer was, it'd be scarce, mighty scarce. Yeah, yeah you're right. You're right. Father Christian, we need to... Uh, turn to the Christian scriptures for a moment. 
They're kind of a mixed bag when it comes to the role of women. Women certainly played a very important role in the life of Christ. In fact, he took the revolutionary step of actually including them, teaching them in his group of disciples. In the early years of Christianity, women played a critical role. They helped Paul on his missionary journeys. Uh, they opened their homes for worship. They were even called apostles and deacons. But then we discover this dichotomy. Paul, on the one hand, in the third chapter of Galatians, says there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ. But he wrote to the church in Corinth, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. And he writes to Paul in First Timothy, or to Timothy in First Timothy, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now, I don't know if you've shared that with Anastasia. She's here. I'd love to get her take on, on those particular oh. scriptures in the house of Anderson. It's her favorite, it's her favorite scripture. <laughs> Framed in the wall. So we have on the one hand, this we are all one in Christ, mm -hmm. and Jesus treating women certainly as equals to the men. Mm -hmm. But then in later years, it seems in the centuries that followed, more emphasis was put on the women being submissive and silent. Mm -hmm. In fact, they had no role to play in leadership. Uh, they did not exercise you know, in independent wealth, property, inheritance, till much, much later. So can you help us understand why Christianity took this patriarchal turn? Mm -hmm. I just want to first acknowledge that <laughs> Rabbi Durbin, Sheikh Shafayat, and myself, I've met your wife because we did an event uh, not too long ago. <clears throat> it's, I think it's funny that we're married to very strong-minded women, you know. <laughs> and so here we are talking about these scriptures and wrestling with it. Um, we, we didn't uh, marry any passive women here, gents. Uh, and, um, and, and so I think it's just funny how these three leaders were talking about this. Is there misogyny within the scripture? Um, and so it, we, we did try to have a session on the third session that our wives would be up here. I um, really that, wanted. That did not go over uh, as well as we thought it would. They were just like, no, that's you. I'm not getting up there um, and taking the fall and trying to bail you guys out. Uh, but wouldn't that have been great, right? To have, it would have been have great. Our, our wives up here talking about what they think. Darcy pushed for it, uh, but maybe in the next round they'll they'll be more they'll be more up for it. So, but I have to say, up here it is more matriarchal because I boss you guys around mercilessly. Yes, again, God bless you, God bless you. You're the reason why this thing is 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 going. So, all right. So, uh, George Blaney makes a, a historian, church historian. He makes this this great comment saying. Uh, women had the most power they ever had during the time of Jesus and during that first century of the church. And then after that, it was just all downhill. And it gets back to, uh, Sheikh, what you were saying, is that culture will always win so far that we see. Um, that the culture of what we have and who's in charge and who's in authority, we see it in history books. Our history books are written by the winners. So if you have men who are in charge within the culture and you're coming out of a Hellenistic culture, especially for Christians, Christianity came through the Hellenism. As a Catholic priest, you can't do anything until you study Hellenism and you study Platonic and Aristotelian thought for two years before you even get to Scripture. You've got to understand the Greek thought, the Roman thought, the way of looking at things. That's where Christianity came out of. Uh, there, there's not much to say for women being an authority there. So Christianity, early Christianity, was through that lens. Culture, as much as we try to say that we're so true to the word and we're so true to the early church, and stop it. Culture is going to influence us. We're imperfect beings. We're broken. We're sinful. It's going to happen. Uh, and we do our best. We do our best to live into this image of God that Paul talks about, that we are all made one in Christ. You know, we're, we're neither slave or free man, woman or man, uh, Jew or Greek. So that being said, uh, 
I will use that as a reason why we start to see throughout the years after that first couple centuries, uh, women's power start to start to decrease um, more and more. In that first century and during Jesus' time, yes, it was very revolutionary what he was doing. Now the 12 disciples, they were all men, all right? Um, but Paul does talk to, he uses a word for apostle, which is greater than apostle, and he's referring to certain women. Uh, we do have women, as you said, who were leading home churches. Uh, he puts a lot of responsibility for these early women. There's, uh, depending on which scholar you talk to, that they're referred to as uh, deacons and preachers. Uh, some other scholars would say, no, that's a misinterpretation. Uh, so, but there, there's a lot around this. And then in, in Christianity, you'll see this split between complementarianism, which you refer to, and egalitarianism in the Christian world. And so you have some churches that absolutely won't put women in a position of teaching and preaching and in leadership. Uh, and it's not because out of a submissiveness, it's more saying we believe more complementarianism. Wayne Grudem is more of a, a modern theologian who talks a lot about that. Side note, he was my neighbor in Chicago. Had no idea when I was just a little kid in Chicago that this guy next door who had a very strong wife and a very powerful wife who ran the whole show and later I find out that this guy is now the number one authority on complementarianism in America right now wow. on why men should be in leadership positions and women should not. In um, the church. In the church. So now, thank you for bringing me back home. So friends, many people would say, scholars, not me, scholars, because I'm not that smart, but scholars would say that what Paul is talking about when he says that submissiveness, they should not be teaching and they should be listening to their husbands. That's the home. It's not the church the home. Now, in Corinth, he specifically states in the church, it should be like that. It should be in the back row. Uh, Paul is also a salesman. Paul is selling the Jesus movement. Paul is dealing with a Roman uh, culture that if women are in those, those uh, leadership positions, the movement will get shut down. Mm. If we start putting women in these roles, and, and you had women who were mystics, women who were, uh, you would call them Pentecostals now, speaking in tongues and, and being, uh, they, they were prophets and they were speaking boldly. They were being disruptive. They were being disruptive and, and accessing God in a way that the men were not. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Can you just put something on your head and go sit in the back? Because uh, the Romans are starting to find out about this and they're going to shut us down. But because in other congregations, in his other letters, he is much more open to women being in leadership because they're in a much more, they're in a bigger city where it was a, just a different context. In scripture, we always have to look at context. And that's why I don't think Paul is being, uh, he, he, he speaks out both sides of his mouth intentionally. Over here, it's going to work. Over here, it isn't. And we see that with a lot of leaders of revolution throughout the history of mankind. They're half the revolution wants to go all the way over here, and the leader has to go, no, no, guys, we stay right in the middle. If you go too far over here, um, we'll, we'll get shut down. There's no way we're going to make any progress. MLK had to deal with that. The movement wanted to go way over here, and he had so much resistance from the folks, from, from the movement, saying, why are you settling for the middle? He's like, because I want the middle, because if without the middle, we'll be back to where we started. Uh, and so Paul... He's, he's, he's doing a bit of that. Now, that's my take. So he's a salesman, basically. Yeah, I mean, that, that's my take, and others might disagree with that, but, that, but I think that there's, there's, there's scholarship that would support that because of the context of the letters right. and why he would speak out of both sides of his mouth. Uh, but now, I would, I would say, though, that, that there were women in leadership, um, and I would push back a little bit that after that there was no women in leadership, especially in clergy, because uh, there, there, there were. It just wasn't um, as, 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 as pronounced and mainstream. In this uh, debate about complementarity and equality, is, is it really limited in, in some ways to religious duties so that in, Christ, in the Christian context, the people who are complementarians, are they fine with women being CEOs or right. it, are they? Well, it, it depends on the church. Right. Uh, so, so I think some churches will say absolutely not. The women, that the, her, her position, and a lot of times in these churches, though, you can ask, and you'll see this, uh, the recent podcast, uh, uh, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, they interview a lot of folks from that movement. It was more of a non-denominational Baptist movement. Uh, the, the women felt very empowered. You know, I'm speaking from their 
their voice, I'm quoting them, I'm not saying, okay. Um, and uh, I'm married, I wanna be, stay married, and I'm happy here. Uh, but they would say, no, this is my position, I like this, I wanna run the house, and man, you don't tell me what to do, I run all this, and you run all that. And no, I don't, and so a lot of women in that, in, in that church plant, and they, they were pretty big churches throughout the country, said um, they stopped working, and they stayed at home. Um, and then the man had also that pressure of saying, well, you got to bring home the bacon, bro, because now you got to provide where she's not. Uh, so, but no, and then other ones, Paul, would, people would say Paul was not talking about, uh, he was talking about within, um, he was talking about outside the house, that, that you should not be telling the man what to do inside the house. Church is different because Paul has him teaching and preaching. Sheikh, in, in terms of Islam, is it considered... Uh, sort of bad form for a woman to be a business leader if she, because she's supposed to be at home or doing domestic duties? Um, a, a, an easy answer for that is that the prophet, peace be upon him, his wife, actually his first wife, was a businesswoman. So that answers the question. If it was not Islamic, he would not have married a businesswoman because whatever he did, he sort of exemplified. And she was one of the most wealthiest women at the time. Mm. She was 15 years older than him. So everything, and yet he got married to her. So Islam, a woman does not have to work in Islam. She does not have to, but it's her choice. It's her prerogative. She has the, the rights to. And sometime before, I must have explained, um, the man has to maintain her, the husband, whether she earns or whether she has or she does not have. But she has the rights. And I mean, again, as I said, the best example, the prophet, peace be upon him, exemplified it by marrying as the owner of the company, the proprietor, the CEO, the everything, wealthy woman. So Islam if your no daughter came to you and said, I want to be a CEO or I want to be a very important businesswoman, that's my pursuit in life, would that be fine? Totally fine. Totally and they fine. do it. Good. <laughs> Actually, my daughters, my daughters run the business, their operation. Wonderful. I, I sit here and they run the office. They're the one who manage everything. <laughs> they, they, you know, the hard thing is when they tell me what to do, I'm like, all right, okay. <laughs> so I got to listen, let it go through, but then I do my own thing anyhow. It is. <laughs> But I give them the rights to see what to do, and they're the one. My, one of my daughters, she runs an international organization. She just came back from Malaysia. She's heading back again, community social work. The other one runs all my tours and groups. So they're the ones that uh, do everything. Yeah. So in, in, Christian, in, in the circles that practice complementarity, can a woman break out of that to be a businesswoman, a, a power in her own right? I've never been part of a complementarian church, um, but so for the ones that I would say that are really committed to that, so it's, uh, you would, once you go deeper into the church, you would leave your work and say, no, my, my work, my complement, we complement each other, you bring home the bacon and you run that show, and I run this home and I run these children, um, and you don't get in my way and I don't get in yours, and we complement each other that way. That would be their approach. And then, but in the church, the same way, you wouldn't have um, women preachers or teachers or lead pastors right. in that. And there's, yeah, and that's, they... That Certainly be, in Reformed Judaism, I mean, women are c CEOs, and uh, even though, as, as you said, that you practice a kind of complementarity, women do break out of the domestic role and scene. You want to speak to that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, I just want to go back quickly on the commandments, just as a point of clarification. As Jews, we have 613 commandments. Most of those we cannot perform because they were instituted during the temple period. Mm. Because the temple no longer exists in its ancient form, some of those commandments actually have no validity at all. So we're only actually talking of the 613 commandments, we're only talking about a, a couple hundred that actually can be, can be done. Um, I think also from, from a reform perspective, which is to say embracing modernity, embracing tradition, trying to find that balance, really the big, the big shift happens 
1972, mm -hmm. right? Sally Priesland, for those that may be familiar or perhaps not, she was the first female to be ordained as a rabbi in this country. She has served for over 40 years. I think, no, more than that, uh, 50 years. Um, she just retired. Um, in England, Jackie Tabak, 1975. You have conservative Judaism in 1986 with Sally, I want to say, not Sally Jesse Raphael, though I watched her as a kid. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's um, uh, whatever it may be. But she becomes, in, in, in the 1980s, and the shift starts happening. I mean, we see the shift today. You go back 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, right? maybe you have one or two women in your rabbinical class. Today, the number is something like 70% women, 30% male. Hmm. When I entered rabbinical school, I had five female colleagues. I had seven um, male colleagues. I was ordained with three women and two men. It's just taken us thousands of years to get here. Yes. But I also think that when we look at, at the importance of, of women, I think we have to understand it uh, twofold. One is that in Jewish tradition, women have always been known. This is not me speaking. This is, uh, we'll leave it there. <laughs> women were seen as a distraction. Women were seen as luring men away from their main purpose in life, which was the study of Torah. Isn't that the man's weakness? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's not, I, I agree. It's not the women necessarily alluring. Yes. It's the man. And, and, and look, we see this, and I mean no disrespect to my more, more traditional congregations, but you see this, we have in Hebrew a terminology called the mechitza, and mechitza means separation. So sometimes you have women's galleries on top, Maybe there is a divider between men and, and women. Well, the challenge, and again, this is just my own conjecture, is that when I've gone to, you know, very orthodox services, half the time the men are trying to look over to see the women, the women are looking over to try and see the men, and there's a huge distraction. Reform Judaism looked at it and said, why are we separating our families? Isn't prayer to be accessed by all of us? So. Why separate women and children and families when we can celebrate together? Mm -hmm. That's the one. The other is, I think we go back to our tradition and go back to 1 Samuel. Okay? For those that are familiar with 1 Samuel, you have one of the most beautiful and enriching stories of the story of Hannah. Now, why is Hannah so important? She is the first woman to ever publicly acknowledge personal prayer. Mm. Okay, not to say prayer didn't exist back then, it did, but for... Right, and for she those, was accused of being drunk. Yes, right, and just for those that may not be familiar, right, she goes onto the altar, she, she offers herself a personal petitionary prayer. And the priest comes out and goes, what is the matter with you? You're a woman. You have no right on this altar. And I see your lips moving, but nothing's coming out. It's called personal prayer. Give me a son or else. Right? God's response in some way. What do you mean, what else? What are you going to do? Right? And in some way back then, the understanding was God governs all which is above and which is below. But yet what Hannah says is, if you don't give me a child, I will not drink and I will not eat. And you, God can't save me from that. I'll die. And God grants her a child to whom she dedicates to temple service of Samuel. But I think that that story is so important and so impactful that a woman can offer prayer. And if we fast forward thousands of years later, through her efforts, we have personal petitionary prayer. So I think, I think there, there's, a lot, there's a lot wrapped into it. There's a lot wrapped into it, and she was treated very dismissively, thought to be sort of either drunk or 
off her head that she's just you know, having this personal prayer. So sometimes the women are ahead of the men and it just takes you a while to and, and, catch and Darcy, up. I think, I think exactly just that is, because even if you look at the story of Hannah, why is it so, so, why do we keep talking about it? Because it's about one's own ability to commune with God directly. Mm. And in some way, sure, yes, our patriarchs and matriarchs had that opportunity, but they didn't appeal to God. God spoke to them, whereas Hannah directly speaks to God by herself. And the mother of Jesus, Mary, directly quotes Hannah in her Magnificat. Yes, and even if you go with Christianity, right? If you look at Jesus' bloodline, where does he lay descendantry? The house of David. Go back to the book of Ruth. Okay? Mm -hmm. Ruth, of course, being another incredible woman who has no allegiance after both She's a of her husband and her, she marries her brother-in-law, once they both die, write the very famous phrase. You can leave. You don't need to be here. Go back to Moab. And her response, wherever you're, you go, I will go. Your God. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your God is my God. Your people are my people. And then, of course, as she is trying to sustain herself through food and goes into this ginormous field owned by a gentleman named Boaz, they... You don't have to tell the whole story. They, they, they. It's a long story. They, they do their. <laughs> the, they do Eventually, the devil's tango. Eventually, she and Boaz get married, and as my thirteen or twelve-year-old will say, the devil's tango. Right? What happens with Ruth and Boaz? They have a son. What's his son's name? Jesse. Jesse has a son, and his name is David. David. Thus, the blood lion of the tribe of Judah. If I may just add as a rabbi, Please. Said, hey, a good point you made, it's more or less really because of the weakness of the men that the women have to be separated. Are they separated in your... In the mosque, you know, in the mosque, um, the women are in the back. So the question was asked, why don't you put the women in the front if there's equality? But again, because of the weakness of men. The women, if, if the women were to pray in front, as Muslims, we prostrate. Do you think the man will be concentrating on <laughs> prostration? Or they will be prostrating on a woman in front it's of a, him? It's a certain viewpoint, right? Let's be real. Sort of the modesty and the weakness of men being distracted by women. That's why the women are in the back. Next point. The men don't see the women when they are praying. But with the new system, as you were talking about top story and top... The woman can see the men on a camera, on television. Or if they're on a the top floor and there's glass, you can look down and follow. But the men are not allowed to see you or put a, a, a TV on the men's side to see the ladies. Hmm. But the ladies can see the men when we are praying. Because we so, don't get so distracted. Women, because women, women are stronger. Women are much more stronger in, in, in certain areas. Let's give them credit for that. I be very, I'm, I'm always, my mom, I learned that from my mom that women are very strong. That's why God made them be the mothers. So that's it, the weakness of men. And um, so a lot of these laws are designed. Like, for example, the women are not allowed to pray next to the men. Why? Because even if it's your own wife, you can be, instead of thinking of God, you could be thinking about when you go home tonight. It's so you might true. Be thinking bedroom things. Plus, you put your hands in the hand of another woman. Oh my God, you're going to be checking quality of skin, silk, touch, soft. Where is the concentration with God? So that's it. It's nothing to do with an inferior complex of women. No way at all. It's the weakness of men and the flesh of the woman. So it's a sort of guideline for protection of spirituality. That's probably a good place for us to cut off the discussion and maybe do some Q&A. We have time for it. But to sort of yeah, end on the I note of the weakness question? of men. Yeah, can I ask you a question? As the, as the lone woman up here? Yeah. Okay, does it drive you nuts, though, that you... You've, you've heard from the Quran, the Torah, and the Christian scripture. You've studied it all in preparation for today. And you're hearing that the word of God certainly presents a case for, uh, well, I, I would say, for 
uh, egalitarianism for providing space for women to step into leadership roles. And uh, however, uh, culture has won, and here we are in 2024, and we can look at 1970 being the big break, at least from a Judeo-Christian standpoint, where we really start to see women in ordained roles. I mean, the Quakers beat us way before, so the Quakers led the way. Um, but for like a lot of other mainline denominations, it was really the 1970s. So that's 1,970 years from a Christian perspective, and then we see from the, the, rab the, the rabbinical traditions the same. We go back to the original word, you can make a case contrary to that. This should have happened a lot earlier. I drive you nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why I keep, keep emphasizing that in Scripture, at least in the beginning, in each of the faiths, we're, we're equal. It just has gotten tilted toward the patriarchal aspect of our culture. Men tend to dominate, and now we're finally becoming more egalitarian. We'll see where it goes. And, and I want to preface it also saying that I, I'm not making a case against complementarianism. I, mean, I myself believe in egalitarianism. However, a, uh, I might have fellow Christians in here who definitely believe in a complementarianism and are very happy and, and feel driven. And it, that's great. I mean, so the, the, I think we have to be careful too by not, uh, or at least I want to be careful by saying, I'm not saying that's wrong per se. If there's a Christian community that feels, or any spiritual community that says, I feel empowered, great in this, if there's secular communities that do that. Um, it's not a great. question of inferior and superior. Correct. It's Correct. equal but in different domains. But, but we're we're so. fleshing out the scripture today, so, okay, sorry. And, and, and just to also say, because I think it, it's significant and important to raise, even from a Jewish perspective, if you look at it, what denotes Jewish status is through the mother. Mm -hmm. It's through her bloodline and her bloodline alone. Now why? Men went off to war. Men died. There was no way of verifying Jewish status. To the woman, you could. And there was, and, and, and I know we're gonna go over this in the next couple, couple sessions, because there really is a lot in terms of the protection of and the support for uh, women and women's rights. Some may have heard the term tikkun olam, which means to repair the world. However, 2,000 years ago, that was not the case. It was never meant as a repairing or mending of our fractured and broken world. Tikkun olam was set in place, as we understand from what we call the Mishnah, our oral tradition. It was very clear it was about protection of women's rights. Hmm. If you think also about in a Jewish wedding, we have what we call a ketubah, a legally binding Jewish document that is signed by bride and groom that uh, verifies their religious obligations in becoming um, uh, uh, unified under marriage. The ketubah, in a very traditional sense, will say, I'm going to pick on your wife on this one. Anastasia's worth three donkeys, two camels, and a horse. Now, we may laugh at it and say, that's rather offensive that you would say that a woman is worth X amount. But actually, what it's saying is, God forbid something were to happen to your husband. You, being worth three donkeys and a camel, those are highly prized animals that you can use for work or sell in order to sustain yourself, much like the engagement ring, right? In Judaism, we are separated by what we call uh, Nisuin and Kiddushin, holiness, the betrothal, and the marriage itself. Well, the engagement ring and actually the acquisition, which is actually what it's kind of told, is that a man acquires a wife, a woman, but the tradition is, is that it, something must be presented to her of something of value. Oh, yeah. Right? We use the engagement ring as something of value, of God forbid something happens to your husband. You can take your engagement ring, sell it in order to sustain yourself. It's marriage insurance. Is that what you're saying? Marriage insurance? But, but, and, and there's a lot more uh, with I'm it. I'm going to get the mic right. yeah. yeah, I know. You know, while he's getting the mic, Islam, we got the same thing. It's called mahar. You've got to present the, the wife with something very valuable that 
is very prestigious for her. <clears throat> and also, does she, you know, Islam, the law is your mother has more rights than your father. Oh yeah, the prophet, peace be upon him, was asked, whom should I love more? He said, your mother, three times, your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father. So the mother has more status and is of a highest level of, of, of affection, consideration, and care for a child than a father. That even though the father is responsible to maintain and take care, but the poor guy does not have that status. <laughs> See, see what a woman has more. That's, and that's the authority. But a that's woman who more. doesn't have children, how is she viewed? Oh, she, you know, she, in Islam, she's also considered like a mother to her sister's children, her brother's children. Because we were taught that if you, you don't have a parent, then your parents, your father's brother, okay. or your mother's sister, like love you right. should give them that kind right. of respect, dignity, care, respect, hospitality, and do, you know, whatever is called caring for them in that love and that sharing. And, it, uh, you know, it's In that so responsibility. Yeah. We have uh, some questions? I'm sure you probably have a number questions in your mind. There's a microphone right there. And so if you're able um, to, yeah, go to the mic. And please direct it to, to whichever. The Everything to the rabbi. <laughs> Definitely because of their geographic location, and that's what I mentioned before, different countries, the, the men exercise different rights, and that does not mean that they are right to do that. It's just their cultural upbringing. And that's why I use the Saudi Arabia thing. Saudi, who was so strong and never allowed women to drive a motor car, they are now allowing women in almost every different aspect of life in Saudi Arabia. And that's a living proof which makes answering this question easy because they were always the one tarnished for not allowing women to drive. So that proves the culture in other countries. What would you say should happen to the women? Well, you know, I must say that social media is one and education is another. <clears throat> they, a lot of times they are they are clipped from having the opportunity to see what's going on in the rest of the world. And that's why most of these women there would love to come across in the West because they're oppressed across there. And I'm not saying that women are not oppressed. They are oppressed in many countries by, by their husbands and their families. They don't have the rights. You know, in Islam, there is nothing like a forced marriage. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, once a woman went to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and said, my father... I mean, to answer your question directly, forced me to get married. He said that marriage is not valid because the woman has the rights to say, I have accepted or I don't accept. That's her choice. That's her rights. So you're saying go back to the Quran. Yeah, live the Quran. And because unfortunately, this is what these people do. And that's what, I mean, that's what we are preaching all the time. And especially um, Islamic scholars throughout the world and nowadays, especially in the West, are uh, trying to get those things undone. And that's why a lot of those women, even the men have a hard time, huh? <clears throat> you know, like the rabbi spoke of the, 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 pre the gift that you gotta give the woman. In some Arab countries, the women demand millions. So it becomes now extravagant from the woman's side. So now the men prefer to get married to women in the West <laughs> because they don't demand so much. So, you know, it goes both ways. The culture is really ridiculous. 
Well, we are considered Sunnis. The majority of the Muslims are Sunnis, yeah. The Shias are just a, a very minority, small minority, yeah. You Other questions? Me. Thank you. like what you said. That's why when you have multiple wives, you don't have a choice to sleep on a bed. You've got to sleep on the floor. <laughs> so it's a problem. Anyhow, um, <laughs> anyhow um, where did these wives come from? I'll have to pass it on to the rabbi. It came from the rabbi. <laughs> you know, you know, it's just a joke, but really when people ask me that question, the real law on that, the Quran has limited women to have only four wives. Maximum. It is the, and I'm not uh, a scholar of Christianity and Judaism, but if you go through the history, that's how Suleiman could have had any amount of wives. They, um, Jacob had four official wives. That's why you have the 12 tribes and the 12 sons married to two sisters and married to their maids. Abraham had two wives from our point. Then you have other researches, many more wives. So it's a biblical thing. It's an Abrahamic thing. I'm only saying it did not start from the Quran and it did not start from Islam. And to we determine started it from? We started it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's critical that you be able to determine patrimony. So therefore, a woman cannot have multiple husbands because you wouldn't know whose son or daughter this was. And, and, and let me just also state as well, because I think, I think um, um, Sheikh, thank you, because I think a lot of the, the, the spillage comes on um, to us. <laughs> a part of that also, I mean, look, if you go back to King David, we know King David had multiple wives, Michal, Abigail, Bathsheba, right? If you go to King Solomon, Solomon. we know that Solomon had something like 990 some odd wives. Right? But our tradition makes it very clear, which is the Talmud, early rabbinic literature, had made it very clear. There are rules, very stringent rules, on what one must do in order to um, have for themselves more than one wife. Okay? So the, the understanding is a woman must be provided for equally. She must be given sexual relations, food, shelter, and clothing. A woman you cannot have favoritism. You can take as many wives as you want, but that stops around the 8th century of the Common Era. And it comes out of a statement by a rabbi out of Germany who had made the statement that said, no longer may you have multiple wives. You can only have one. I look back to that 8th century and say, thank you. I can barely deal with one. <laughs> But that being said, there, there is something there too because it is um, a woman must be provided for equally. However, the laws of divorce are very different in Israel than they are here. Okay? A woman does not have the right to file for divorce. You can't. Unless your husband does not provide sexual relations, which is actually really tough to prove. Okay? Um, a woman is not provided for shelter, food, clothing. Those are the only grounds that a woman can, can file for divorce within the state of Israel because Israel is, in some way, run judicially by what we call the rabbinut. 
which is the, the Orthodox community, right? So, uh, or, or more traditional lines of, of a judiciary system. So that would be able to say, look, if a woman came to the court and said, my husband beats me, that's not grounds for divorce. Because the rabbis would say, prove it. How do we know it's not self-inflicted? How do we know these things? So in, in some way, the big challenge in Israel, um, and I'm going to go back post, uh, sorry, pre-October 7th, the challenge with Israel is it's not a difference between or a challenge between Jew and Muslim. It's about equality between men and women. That's the challenge Israel faces. Because in some way, uh, and for those that may not be familiar, if you want to get married in Israel, there's only one way to do it, and that's through the Orthodox. Well, they can tell you no. So what do a fair amount of the Israeli population do? They jump on a boat, they go to Cyprus, or they go to Jordan, or they go, I don't know why they would go to Egypt, but they would go, right, they would go to these other countries, they would get married, and then when they went back and re-entered into the state of Israel, Israel recognizes those marriages that happen in Cyprus or in Turkey hmm. or anywhere else. That's how they get away with it, right? So, so equality is something that I think the Jewish world still faces, and we're still challenged by it. I think the West, where we live, is vastly different than the Middle East perspective and those customs and those traditions. Also, was, was, didn't you mention this one time in one of the radio shows that polygamy was also a, uh, a product of war because there weren't enough men to go around? They were all, or was, was that you who said that? Uh, it could be. Maybe it was episode 59. Okay. Does, one did, does that... Does that <laughs> Did, well, did I think that even, hold or no? even, even if you look at, at, at King Solomon, right? Solomon is, is kind of the prime example. Why did he have so many wives? It wasn't about the fact that he goes, I have 990 beautiful women. It was foreign relations. It was political alliances to expand political alliances. It was to expand um, the territory, right? So Solomon would have, you know, mistresses and concubines and wives in Ethiopia, in uh, Sudan, in Chad. In Which was strictly against the rules, really. I yep. mean, you're not supposed to be doing that. You are not. Well, I think we've reached our time. You want to tease the next week? I'll tease next week. We mentioned it uh, at the beginning. We're going to be talking about a myth, perhaps, uh, that Christianity, Judaism, Islam, that the Christian or the Abrahamic faiths have been the source of more violence, war, conflict than any other single factor. Is that true, false? How do we come down? And obviously, we're in a very tense time, and we may uh, address that issue, but in a circumspect and wise way. We don't need to... You aren't geopolitical experts. I'm certainly not. So we can pray for the Holy Land. We can t have our own take on it, but there won't be any bloodletting here. <laughs> Would you like to close or us? blood libels. Or blood don't need any of those. No, no, no. Dear God, we are grateful and so appreciative for so many of us to come here today to learn, to engage. For many of us, we have questions, questions of Islam, questions of Judaism, questions about Christianity, and how we as a collective community can come together and find for us some solace to the answers that we seek. I thank you, God, for this gift, this gift of one another, of mutual respect, of care and pride, and the ability for us to question and to learn more about one another. Oh God, may the knowledge that we learn, may the knowledge we use, may we bring it back to our homes, to our communities, so that we can stop anti-Islamophobia, 
mm. anti-Semitism. You guys don't really... You're welcome. <laughs> Deepen our understanding of Christianity, where all three intersect so that we can become more compassionate, more understanding, and work for God's sake. May the work of our hands, may the meditations of our mouths be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>